so welcome to the seminar today. And uh, today our speaker is uh, David Kolsmeyer. He was in Harvard as a PhD student, and now he has moved to uh, MIT, and he's now working on von Neumann algebras in gravity. And we are now going to hear from him about his latest exciting paper. So over to you, David. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah, so thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be speaking here today. Um, and yeah, I'll be talking about von Neumann algebras in JT gravity. And this is gonna be based on a recent paper that I wrote on this subject. And I also wanted to draw your attention to an earlier paper that came out by Pennington and Whitten that discusses the same topics. Um, so I would encourage you to read that paper as well. So let me get started with the introduction. So basically the big picture here is that the Euclidean gravitational path integral has been invaluable for learning various things about holographic CFTs. Um, so for example, it's been used to study the, statist the statistics of black hole microstates and and you know, people have found that the black hole microstates exhibit this level of repulsion phenomenon, which you also find in random matrix models. And just as another example, uh, people used um, the Euclidean path integral, namely replica wormholes, to explain why the page curve of an evaporating black hole takes the form that it does from semi-classical gravity. Um, so if we wanna use the Euclidean gravitational path integral to compute entropies, uh, usually one uses something called the replica trick. So the replica trick, which you might've heard about before, um, is just a procedure where you can replicate the boundary conditions for your path integral an integer number of times, compute something, and then you have to analytically continue the answer in the number of replicas. And uh, in the cases where there's replica symmetry, or in other words, where you're only integrating over replica symmetric uh, configurations of the metric and fields, um, the analytic continuation is usually straightforward, and in this way, you know, you could derive the Ryutakinagi formula. Um, but there could be complications uh, due to replica symmetry breaking effects, and these could be as simple as perturbative corrections in Newton's constant. Um, so in certain examples, even with replica symmetry breaking effects, it's been possible to use von Neumann algebras to put the replica trick on a firm conceptual footing and thereby putting the concept of gravitational entanglement entropy on a firm conceptual footing. And so an example where this was done previously was in a paper by Jin Zhao Wang, um, where he studied the replica trick in this West Coast replica wormholes model. And basically the purpose of the talk today is to provide another example where von Neumann algebras can be used to put the replica trick on a firm conceptual footing. So in this talk, the interest is gonna be in JT gravity minimally coupled to matter. And this is arguably one of the simplest examples of holography. And um, in particular, it's known to describe the low energy dynamics of the SYK model because both are governed by a symmetry breaking pattern. Um, so in particular, we're going to take this theory and we're going to quantize it on the spatial interval with ADS boundary conditions times time. So the space time is roughly going to look like, uh, well, it's going to look like, uh, um, you know, a two-sided black hole in two-dimensional gravity with propagating matter. And also in this theory, there's the coupling constant, Newton's constant, um, which sometimes people also call phi b. In this talk, I'm just going to set the coupling constant equals to one for simplicity. Um, but in, in this calculation, this coupling constant could take on any value. So we're computing things exactly in Newton's constant, or in other words, we're including all the perturbative uh, corrections in Newton's constant. So here, I'm just going to summarize the main result, and then I'll come back and explain this in more detail later. So um, on the right boundary, you could imagine there being an observer, and they have access to you know, a certain set of observables actually an algebra of observables. This includes the ADM Hamiltonian on the right boundary, as well as uh, operators from the matter field, which are inserted on the right boundary. And so you can take these operators and generate a von Neumann algebra, which I'll just call AR. And likewise, one can do the same thing for the left boundary. So I'll call that AL. And then the main technical result of this work is to show that um, the von Neumann algebra of operators that commutes with AR is AL and vice versa. And we also showed that the only operators that are contained in both algebras are just uh, multiples of the identity. 
And these results were also part of this Pennington Wooden paper I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, so, so again, I'll explain. Uh -huh. can, can I ask something about this? Um, so uh, sure. this, uh, in this, uh, so the issue is to, uh, so what is exactly the setup that you are trying to do is the West Coast model has only one boundary, right? And uh, in, or, but if you take, the point is if you take multiple replicas, then uh, how to set so, up this? Uh, so, so, so we're, we're not doing the West Coast model. Um, so I'll explain in more detail, but basically we're just taking um, GT. So we're just considering a two-sided black hole and matter fields <laughs> propagating on the two-sided black hole. Okay. Um, and we just have like a right wedge, a left wedge. Yeah. And, and um, these algebras I mentioned, AR and AL, they should be interpreted as algebraic definitions of the two entanglement wedges. Um, so that's kind of the physical interpretation. Mm -hmm. So just to understand, so here the issue is uh, not the uh, replicas because you're in a Lorentzian setup and uh, correct. Uh, so so what exactly is the is a challenge here to uh, to see? Uh, yeah. So, so good. Yeah. So the challenge is going to be replica symmetry breaking effects, and these come from perturbative uh, G Newton corrections. So in particular, if you replicate the boundary conditions n times and you only look at classical saddles, um, then there will be a ZN symmetry. But if you replicate the boundary conditions n times and you integrate over all metrics, um, arbitrary metric configurations in the bulk don't have to have that ZN symmetry. Um, so then the question of how do you analytically continue um, becomes subtle. So okay. that's kind of, yeah. Uh, hi, Great. am I audible? Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, the ADM Hamiltonian is it? Uh, sorry, is it bounded above? I the know. Hamiltonian is bounded from below, so the lowest energy it has is zero. But uh, then, I thought the von Neumann algebra is consisted only of the bounded operators, right? Like good. In sense Thank in you. The operators are bounded. Yes. Yeah, so, so strictly speak, yes. So the Hamiltonian is an unbounded operator. Um, yeah. But you could take bounded functions of it to get bounded operators, which are in the von Neumann algebra. So strictly speaking, that's the setup. Yes. So ADM Hamiltonian itself is not part of the von Neumann algebra AR or AL. Strictly speaking, that's correct because it's unbounded. But you could take bounded functions of it, and those okay. would be part of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Um, good. Okay, so let me give an outline of what's going to come next. Uh, so first, I'm just going to review. Uh, also, the sorry, uh, uh -huh. was it obvious that the intersection of the of the two would be just a trivial algebra? Like, um, it is highly not obvious. Uh, That's that. that yeah, the central that, element, that, right? The the fact that there's no center is. Um, yeah, it, it's it, that's a very non. I mean, it's a very non-trivial statement to prove. I think. Okay. Um, right. Yeah, and that's one of the results of, of of the work to prove that. Yeah. Um. Okay. Good. So so let me uh. Give an outline of what's of what's yet to come. So. First, I'm just going to review the Euclidean path integral uh, of JT gravity with matter, as well as the Lorentzian quantization of JT gravity with matter. And then after that, um, I'm going to define these two algebras more carefully, and I'm going to improve prove the important properties that I mentioned to you before. Um, then after that, I'm going to explain why these algebras admit a, a unique notion of trace. Um, in a particular sense. And so this leads to a unique notion of entropy, which is consistent with the Euclidean path integral. And this is what puts the Euclidean path integral and the replica trick on a firm conceptual footing. Um, and then after that, I'll comment on how using von Neumann algebras to define gravitational entropy differs from other formalisms that have been uh, used to think about gravitational entropy, such as holographic codes. Okay, good. So now uh, we'll get started on the more technical part of this talk. So first, I just want to review uh, some basic facts about um, quantum field theory on ADS-2. 
So let's just consider an arbitrary quantum field theory that's quantized on global ADS2. So here's the metric of global ADS2. Um, it has two ADS boundaries. Um, and I'm going to call the Hilbert space for this matter theory, just the matter Q of T, to be H sub zero. And if we want to prepare states in this Hilbert space, we can do so using half of the Euclidean hyperbolic disk. So this half disk is just half of the Euclidean hyperbolic disk. This black boundary over here is the ADS boundary. Um, and then this horizontal boundary over here represents a constant uh, time slice in global ADS2. And so we can just prepare a state on this slice. And this red dot over here refers to an insertion of a local operator in the theory. Um, and in general, we can use this to create different states. Furthermore, um, you know, the, the, the isometry group of ADS2 is SL2R. Um, and so in particular, we can define three sym symmetry generators which act on this Hilbert space. So I call them here B, H, and P. Um, and basically the way it works is that, um, well, they, they basically uh, act on states in the way that's shown in this diagram. So for example, if you look over here, these black lines represent the flow lines of the rotation symmetry. Um, and now I can act on it with some operator B by an amount theta. And the effect of this is to, when acting on the state, is to basically move these operator insertions, these red dots, um, along an angle theta into their final position over here. Um, likewise, one can do the same thing with the other two symmetry generators. So here's the Hamiltonian, the global energy um, translator. Uh, generator of global energy trans sorry generator of global time translations and likewise here's the momentum for spatial translations and again they just act by moving operators along the flow lines of the uh, um, associated isometry um, and so there's also a state operator correspondence so in particular if you look at uh, this middle diagram over here um, the generators of the global time translation in Euclidean time kind of move all the operators down to a single point at the bottom. And so in this way, if you're given any state on the Hilbert space, um, you know, on, on, this, on this line over here, you could just evolve it until you kind of push it down to this point on the bottom. And so in this way, given a state, you can define an operator and given an operator that's inserted here, that should create a state. Um, okay, so you have a state operator correspondence, just like you do in other contexts. Um, furthermore, the the states in the matter theory transform in discrete series representations of SL2R, or in this case, PSL2R. Um, and the reason why is because it's only for the discrete series representations that the, that the Hamiltonian um, is bounded from below, which is, of course, the property that you want your quantum field theory to have. And so, um, so given this in mind, the primary operators are the operators that kind of sit at the bottom of the representation of the discrete series representation, or they're the operators that correspond to the, state, the states that sit at the bottom of the discrete series representation. And so our interest is really going to be in primary operators. And in particular, in this path integral, we're going to be interested in inserting primary operators near the boundary of the disk. Okay, so previously I was talking about um, just matter on the hyperbolic disk in ADS2. Now I'm going to introduce JT gravity. So this is the Euclidean action of JT gravity. Um, so first there's this term, this topological term. Chi is the Euler characteristic of the, you know, the, that, that depends on the topology of the manifold that, that um, you're, you know, performing the path integral on. And S naught is a is just the parameter. This first term is not going to be too important to us because we're not going to be considering wormholes or topology changing effects in this talk. And then here I have the action of JT gravity and then the action of a matter theory, which is minimally coupled to JT gravity, meaning that um, it only talks to JT gravity through the metric and not the dilaton. Um, so this I matter, it, this depends on the specific matter theory that you're looking at, of course. But here's the action for JT gravity. And of course, the most important feature is that when you integrate out the dilaton, it uh, constrains the manifolds to be um, hyperbolic, um, constant negative curvature, which means that the different manifolds um, can be thought of, at least when we consider the disk case, 
the different manifolds we integrate over can be constructed by just drawing the hyperbolic disk, which I've done here, and then drawing a blue curve that specifies the boundary of the physical manifold that we are interested in. And so in general, when we integrate over all the disk configurations, we're actually integrating over all of the different ways to draw this wiggly blue curve in the asymptotic um, ADS region. And so the boundary condition that we put um, on the ADS boundary uh, is, a, is a condition where we fix the length of the boundary and we also fix the dilettante on that boundary. Um, and we set them both to infinity, but we fix their ratio. And so that will determine uh, beta. And beta has the physical interpretation of uh, an inverse temperature that's associated to the ADS boundary. Um, good, so we think of this disk diagram this integration over all these blue wiggles as computing the partition function of the putative boundary dual to JT gravity, or in this case, JT gravity with matter. Um, and furthermore, we can make things more interesting by inserting matter primary operators on the ADS boundary. And when we do this, um, these will compute uh, insertions of boundary operators, which I'll call O sub I in the putative uh, dual. Um, in, in the putative boundary dual theory. And so here, um, I is just an index that we use if we want to discuss different matter primary operators. Um, so let me illustrate this a little more carefully. So let's consider the following two-point function. Um, so when I write this expression here, it's really meant to um, describe a particular calculation using the gravitational path integral. So again, I'm going to integrate over all the wiggles but each of these two red dots here represents an insertion of a matter primary operator at a particular point on the blue curve that's determined by beta one and beta two. So in particular, we should associate a beta one with the length of the blue segment here and a beta two with the length of the blue segment here. And so the idea is that not only, so we're integrating over all the blue wiggles, and we're not, and we're weighting that integration not only by the action of JT gravity, but also by the two-point function um, in the matter theory, which is evaluated using the matter path integral. And we, again, we interpret this as this as this expression over here. Okay, um, good. So that's just the Euclidean path integral. Now, what we want to do is we want to actually quantize the theory and obtain a Hilbert space and a Lorentzian description, and. So so the way we're going to do that is by writing the Euclidean path integral correlators like this um, as an overlap between a bra and a ket. And we're going to identify the Hilbert space that the bra and the ket lives in. Um, so let me explain this procedure more carefully. So, um, so on the left-hand side, this is my two-point function again. And what I've done is I've picked uh, two arbitrary points, which I've labeled with these green X's, um, and they are located at fixed positions along the blue curve. And the idea is that um, the position of each of these arbitrary green uh, X's, well, for each green X, we label its position with two coordinates. And so in total, there are four coordinates. Um, and an important point is that this whole disk, hyperbolic disk, has an SL2R symmetry. And so we can always choose to work in a reference frame, an SL2R reference frame, where um, these two green points are kind of um, centered uh, or, or are located on the horizontal line that cuts through the disk and are equidistant from the center. Um, and so to, so to, and so once we kind of impose this gauge condition, then um, the positions of the green uh, X's over here are really just determined by one number, which is, the length between them. And so this variable L represents the length between the two X's, but because the length is actually infinity, L represents a renormalized length. So I've kind of subtracted um, an infinity from the actual bare length. And so it's for this reason that this variable L can actually take values from minus infinity to infinity. But intuitively, you should just think of it as the length between these two uh, green X's. So good, so our uh, two-point function can be written in this gauge. And so once we do this, um, the idea is that we can now write this path integral as an overlap between a bra and a ket. So in particular, the ket 
can be prepared by performing the Euclidean path integral on the lower half disk for some fixed value of L and for some fixed matter boundary conditions on the horizontal slice. So in other words, the ket corresponds to the path integral done just up to the halfway point over here where we fix a matter state on the horizontal line and we fix the length. And then the bra over here. So then the bra up here um, refers to the path integral done on the top half of the disk. And the point is that to specify the, uh, if you want, yes, yeah, so the, the, the data that we fix on the horizontal slice here is we fix the length between the two green X's and then we also fix a state in the matter theory. And so this means that um, to insert a complete set of states to evaluate uh, this inner product between the bra and the cat, we have to integrate over the length. We also have to integrate over or sum over all the matter states. And so what this means is that the bra or the cat um, is valued in the Hilbert space L2 of R times H0. So H0 is the matter Q of T Hilbert space I mentioned earlier. And L2 of R is square integral functions of this length L over here. And so in this way, we've kind of cut open the Euclidean path integral and identified a Hilbert space, which is L2 of R times H0. Uh, sorry, I have some elementary questions. So uh, so the uh, so if I understand this procedure, it's, uh, you have already gauge fixed it. So this mm -hmm. uh, graph that you define is, uh, doesn't, these states are not manifestly gauge invariant, this way of thinking about it. So, as an um, well, It's it's okay because there, there's another way to think about this where you do work with gauge invariant states. Um, this is a formalism that I wasn't going to mention, but it actually was mentioned in this other related paper by Pennington and Witten. So there's another way to get at the same results um, where you have, you know, an, an SL like an SL, like you have a Hilbert space you have which admits an action of SL2R. And then you want to project down to the singlets of SL2R. So you can use that too, and you'll get the same results. Um, so I'm kind of taking the perspective that I'm just going to gauge fix the Euclidean path integral, which I'm free to do. And then there's just no more gauge symmetry. And then and I don't have to worry about it. Um, but it's true that the states in this Hilbert space can be embedded into a larger Hilbert space that contains gauge invariant and gauge non invariant states. And in particular, the, if, if we map from this Hilbert space to the larger Hilbert space, the image of this map will be only the gauge invariant states. So you could think of the states I described here as being into as being, you know, as having a one-to-one -one correspondence with gauge invariant states. So I didn't really, um, yeah. So yeah, so in a sense, like if, if if you're able to fix the gauge like correctly, um, then in a sense you haven't like done at something non-gauge invariant, you're just fixing the gauge. I see. So anyway, you, the question is more like you will probably also create states which have a negative norm, right? In this way. Uh, uh, no, this all these all, all these states have positive norm. So in particular, and the reason why they have positive norm is because this Euclidean path integral I'm describing um, obeys reflection positivity. And it follows from reflection positivity of just the Euclidean path integral of the matter theory. So all the states here are positive. The inner product is positive. Um, okay. Uh, okay. And one more sort of elementary question. So, uh, so here I think, if I understood correctly, the distance, the left distance between the two red dots is beta one, a uh, beta one inverse, and the and the and the right distance is beta two inverse, probably. Yeah. Uh, so now, when you put this thing in between, uh, don't you also have to integrate between because you're splitting the two into each of these intervals into two parts. Um, right, I'm splitting each of the intervals into two parts, that's right. Uh, so, um, so the idea is that the blue curve represents the boundary of ADS. And in the putative boundary dual theory, there's a very clear notion of time. So in particular, we should imagine having a ruler that measures time along the blue boundary. And if you want to, specify a correlation function, you have to specify, you know, the exact times where each of the red dots are located. And so I'm doing something similar. I'm sp specifying specific times where the green X's are located. And so we, when, when, it, when we integrate over the positions of the green X's, that's only because we are instructed to integrate over all possible ways of drawing the blue wiggle. 
so in particular, you know, this could be like, for example, this green X could be at like time coordinate, like five, right? Along the blue wiggle. And then when we integrate the blue wiggle, the point that's labeled by time coordinate five could be somewhere else. And so it's in this sense that we're in integrating over the position of all the X's. So we integrate over the position of all the X's um, because we're integrating along the blue curve, but it would be incorrect to integrate over the time coordinate where this X is inserted. Um, so I, I don't mean to sum over all the different places along the blue curve, you know, measured on this ruler where this X is inserted. I just want to pick a, a particular point. And this is just for the purposes of, uh, of, of gauge fixing. I see. Okay, now I get the picture. So essentially, uh, the gauge invariant label is simply L, uh, right? If I understand correctly. Right. Okay. Uh, and that will that is that will that now you are now exhausted all this L two R that you can have. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So I'm starting off with a uh, Euclidean path integral. We computed it using some rules, and then um, I just want to kind of. You know, for for any given configuration, we can choose to view it in whichever SL two R reference frame we want. Mm -hmm. And so, so I three mm -hmm. parameters, right? The two endpoints and this, yeah, uh, and that is then you exhaust all SL two R. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Good. So now we have our Hilbert space. Um, so now that we have the Hilbert space, let's talk about some interesting operators we can define that act on the Hilbert space. Um, so first, let's talk about the right Hamiltonian. So here, okay, so I, I told you how we can prepare a ket using the Euclidean path to go on the half disk. You have to specify the amount of boundary length, beta 1 and beta 2, on either side of, say, an operator, which was inserted here. You have to specify a matter state on this horizontal slice, and you have to specify L. Um, and so I'm going to define the right Hamiltonian to be such that this state gets mapped to the state where here beta two just gets increased by beta two plus beta. That's how the that's what the Hamiltonian should do. Um, likewise, I can also define an operator which I'll call O R, where I can start with the state over here, and then by definition, when I act with O R, um, I simply insert another primary operator in the matter theory exactly at the endpoint of the blue curve, which depends on L, because by definition, by the gauge fixing condition, this endpoint is always supposed to be um, equidistant from the center with the other endpoint. Um, so in this way, I have a Hilbert space and I can just define operators on it um, just by showing how they act on the states. Um, so I told you about OR, I told you about HR. So OL and HL are defined similarly. Here, L is just the, the length operator. So um, it would act on this state just by multiplication by L. And here, K is just the canonical, con canonical conjugate of L. So by definition, you know, L, K equals I. K is just like, you know, minus I, D by DL. Um, good. So these are the definitions of these operators. Um, and for just just for your information, even though we're not going to use this explicitly, um, you can explicitly compute um, formulas for the right and the left Hamiltonian in terms of the length operator, its conjugate, and also these uh, symmetry generating operators uh, that I mentioned before. So these are nice expressions. And from these, you can show that the Hamiltonian is uh, bounded from below, um, in particular, sure. the lowest value. Yeah. What are H and B here? Oh, good. So, um, yeah, so I'm referring to uh, um, this, this slide. So H is the generator of global time translations in the matter theory, okay. and B is the generator of boosts in the matter theory. So the whole Hilbert space is given by, um, so this is the Hilbert space here. And so H and B and P, act on this H0 factor only, um, just operators in the matter theory. And so the full Hilbert space is just the tensor product of just the matter theory with L2 of R. And then the expression for the ADM Hamiltonian on the right and the left kind of mix up the two sectors in this way. Uh, 
Okay, thanks. Great. So um, good. So we talked about the two point function. Now let's also uh, talk about the three point function. And also let's talk about explicit uh, formulas for these things. So, okay, so here's the two point function. Here's the three point function. Um, so if we didn't have gravity or if we took the semi-classical limit where we just take, take G Newton to zero and turn gravity off, then the two and three point functions um, are basically you know, core, one dimensional correlators that are constrained by SL2R symmetry. And uh, the SL2R symmetry completely fixes the two point functions up, you know, up to normalization. And then the three point functions are completely fixed up to structure constants, which usually you can call C, I, J, K. Um, and because uh, you know, in the absence of gravity, you can get completely explicit expressions for these correlators. Once you turn JT gravity on, you can also compute explicit expressions for these correlators. Uh, so let's first talk about the two-point function. So here's the two-point function, and this was calculated before in you know, many different papers here. And so I'm not going to review the derivation. I'm just going to tell you the answer and hopefully make it as intuitive as possible. And the way I'm going to make it intuitive is by drawing this diagram over here, which is supposed to nicely you know, encapsulate this integral. So in particular, we're integrating over two numbers, S1 and S2. So here, this diagram has two regions in it, S1 and S2. Um, oh, I should also say, this circle over here should be thought of as like the ADS boundary, and then inside the circle is the interior. So I have two regions here, S1 and S2. Um, and so we're going to integrate over because so because we have two regions here, we're going to integrate over uh, two parameters with a density of states that is given by this formula. Um, furthermore, I've labeled this edge over here beta one, and so we're going to include a Boltzmann factor. Sorry, this should be a beta one, beta one s one. So I'm going to include a Boltzmann factor here, e to the minus beta 1 s1 squared. So I have a beta 1 next to s1, so I get this. Likewise, I have a beta 2. I have a beta 2 here next to s2, so I'm going to put in a Boltzmann factor, e to the minus beta 2 s2 squared. And then furthermore, I have a line that um, connects i and j. So because i and j are directly connected by a line, I'm going to put in a chronic or delta function that connects them. And then this line is adjacent to s1 and s2. So this means that there should be a function in this integrand that depends on S1 and S2, and also um, the scaling dimension of the operator that uh, that this line that 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 this line ends on. So delta i is the scaling dimension of the matter primary operator, which was inserted um, that corresponds to the operator O i. Um, and so here, this function is this. So I just use this gamma notation here. It's meant to refer to a product of four gamma functions. So I'm taking a product over all four choices of sign. So it's it's a real um, positive quantity. Okay, good. So basically the idea is that um, going forward, it's gonna be a lot easier for me to draw these pictures instead of actually writing these integrals out. But every picture like this that I draw is meant to correspond to an integral. And there's a systematic set of rules that one applies to get the integral. And again, it just involves um, integrating over an S parameter for every region that you have. And then any place that two lines intersect, you just get a function of the neighboring S parameters that, um, okay, so I'll, I'll you know, reiterate this as we go on. So in particular, let's go on to the three-point function. So, um, so the three-point function is represented by this diagram over here. Basically, I just have, so e, so, the three points where I write i, j, and k, these three points correspond to three insertions of matter primary operators on the boundary. So here, i, j, and k. And then between them, I have beta one, beta two, and beta three. And so um, basically to compute the three-point function, I take the three lines and I let them uh, meet at a three-point vertex. And then surrounding this vertex, we have three different regions, S1, S2, and S3. And so um, basically the diagrammatic rules will instruct us to do the following. So for every um, so for every S parameter, we have to integrate over it. So again, I integrate over S1, S2, S3. 
the next rule is that every time you have a bulk line here that intersects the boundary like this, you include a function that depends on the scaling dimension of the matter operator I, and then the two neighboring S parameters. And that's gonna be given by the square root of gamma delta I one, two. And so I have three factors here for these three intersections. Um, furthermore, again, I have these three Boltzmann factors, S1 squared beta one, corresponding to this edge and likewise for two and likewise for three. And then finally, there's another diagrammatic rule um, that corresponds to an intersection of the three uh, bulk lines here. And basically um, I'm supposed to put in a function a very particular function of S1, S2, and S3, as well as the scaling dimensions. And also this function here, Vijk, is proportional to the structure constant Cijk. So in my paper, I explicitly compute this function for some special cases, but in general, it's very complicated. So I'm not gonna mention it here, but it, this just refers to a known specific special function. Um, okay, good. Any questions about this, by the way? because I'm going to come back to this diagrammatic notation a lot. Okay. Um, Sorry, could you please repeat? How do you fix the vertex factor Vijk? Good. So the way, so good. So what we're computing here is a three-point function, but also coupled to JT gravity. So it's kind of like the JT gravity path integral, but weighted by the three-point function of the matter theory. The three-point function of the matter theory is completely fixed by conformal symmetry up to the structure constant C i j k. So what I'm doing is I'm actually explicitly performing this path integral. And then when I evaluate it, I can find that the answer takes this form for a specific function, which here I've just called V i j k. So basically the way to compute Vijk is just to explicitly um, evaluate the three point function um, using some techniques, which are, I think are a little technical to go into detail in this talk, but of these course, are, if you have more questions, yes. These are just a matter uh, part of the uh, theory, right? Like the Vijk encodes only the matter information, not the GD, it's, it's, it does not involve- uh, it, 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 it encodes both. I would say that the Vijk, is given by the three-point function of the matter theory dressed by the just by JT gravity. So in particular, um, so specifically what we do is we take the three-point function and then we act on it with a reparameterization. So I didn't mention this, but each blue wiggle, each configuration of the disk is mathematically encoded by a reparameterization. Um, so in particular, you know, if you have like a 1D conformal theory, um, the you know, like, so in one dimensions, the conformal group is reparameterizations. And so what we do is we take um, the three point function and then we can act on it with an arbitrary element of this conformal group, this reparameterization group. And then we have to integrate over all reparameterizations with a specific action that comes from JT gravity. And so once you do that, then you get an answer which takes this form and you can read off the IJK. Oh, yeah, and uh, the row, uh, the row S one, uh, row S two, and row S three, uh, they are mm -hmm. how how are they fixed? Like uh, they are also fixed by both yes. the JT and the matter contributions together. So the row is actually fixed by um, that can be computed by computing the disk diagram with no matter insertions. So in that sense, the row is fixed by JT only. Okay. Not not the matter. So in, in, if you didn't have matter, you're just talking about JT only, then um, all you could talk about really in this case is the disk and that's completely encoded in the row. Thanks. So roughly speaking, the row comes from the disk. These gammas come from the two point function and the V comes from the three point function. And then the idea is that any higher point function can be built out of all these special functions which I've introduced here. So everything else can be built from these. I don't have to introduce any more functions if I want to compute higher point functions. Uh, sorry, I just want to ask you, if you want to uh -huh. uh, higher point functions, uh, wouldn't you need some bulk analog of this, uh, of the two point function as well, or? Uh, well, if I, if I want to compute higher point functions. If I want to compute a four point function, you have, we mm -hmm. have this, uh, without JT, we will have a conformal block like structure. 
Correct. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, however, if we think in this way of diagrammatically, I can think of a bulk to bulk propagator. Uh, so this is what- Yeah, so, uh, so, you're, so you're thinking of a diagram that looks like this. Um, yeah, so, or how do you really decompose it in this context? So this is what I'm- Do you good. need- So if you want- like, Then you have to- re yes. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to compute the four point function, what you do is you draw the you draw this picture and then you apply the same rules I've described. So for every region, you write, get an S parameter. So I'll write S1, S2, S3, S4. And then for every in for every three point intersection in the interior, you get a V I J K. So here, let me do I J K L. And then I'll call the line in here, I'll call that M. So you're gonna get something that looks like V, I, J, M, uh, S2, S3, S1. And then here for the for this guy, you're gonna get a V, M, K, L, S3, S4, S1. So here I wrote down you know, so again, so basically what you do is you draw this diagram and then you apply the rules that I've been um, mentioning. So for this yeah. vertex he here, I write down this V. For this vertex here, I write down this. Um, and then I can just, you know, for every region here, I integrate with a row. And for every intersection here, I get the square root of gamma. And I package it all up into a single integral. And then I have to integrate over these S parameters. And so what this computes is a single conformal block dressed by JT gravity, and then you sum over all the exchanged operators. Yes, so yeah, it could be interesting to see this more clearly, but uh, so you don't have the analog of the gammas for the internal points, is it? Uh, for, yes, yeah, so for the internal point, um, you just get this V function, this vertex function. And then for the external intersections, you get a square root of gamma. Oh, sorry, in the four point case, could we have a cross diagram like uh, two chords connecting IK and JL? Like then it would be like a single vertex in the interior, right? This is one possibility. Oh, sorry, you're, you're asking about this? Yeah. So, so this diagram is not a diagram that we have. So basically the idea is that, and by the way, I'm gonna come back to this a little later. I'm gonna have more explicit slides on this, yeah, sure. but, but basically the idea is that if there's no gravity, you can compute correlators um, by using conformal blocks. And for every conformal block, it's a procedure where you pick two operators, you fuse them together to get a third operator. And then that third operator, you fuse with something else to get another operator and so on. Um, and so this fusion always involved should always be visualized using a three point vertex because you fuse two operators and get a third. So that's a three point vertex. Mm -hmm. So in this description of fusing one at a time, so, so the procedure of fusing things together one at a time is captured by a tree diagram with trivalent vertices only. So because a four point vertex doesn't play a role in the story of like fusing operators together to, you know, to compute the correlators. We don't have a vertex that looks like this. It's just three point vertices only. And then an arbitrary correlator can be built out of these three point vertices, just as in the usual matter theory, we could build correlators out of conformal blocks, which are visualized with tree, using tree diagrams with three point vertices. Thanks. And also the uh, in the lower diagram, uh, mm -hmm. you'll have three inequivalent. Uh, so in the four point case, you'll have three inequivalent diagrams, right? You can do fusion with IJ or IL and so on and so forth. That's correct. So so yeah. So so actually, um, there there are really two inequivalent diagrams. So the reason why is because UK. So here I've described fusing L and K together. Yeah. Um, two inequivalent. Diagrams. Yeah, so here I've described fusing L and K together, um, and then you could also fuse I and L together, but you can't really fuse L and J together because K is like in the middle. Um, you can't bring L and J together with while keeping K away. Okay. Um, okay, good. Um,
Okay, by the way, I wanted to ask, how am I doing with time? Is there a time I should try to wrap up by or? Uh, you know, you're doing very well, I think it's- uh, Okay. You have like 10, 15 minutes, that should be fine, I guess, and it's ahead of time. Okay, yeah, so I'll try to wrap up hopefully in 15 minutes or so. Um, okay, I'll probably have to speed up a little bit, but I'm still- I don't know, I meant uh, you can have 10 more minutes uh, on top, so you can have 20. Oh, minutes. on top. On top. Oh, okay. 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 That's that's good. Thank you. Okay. So good. So anyway, so the purpose of the previous slides was just to tell you the explicit answer for the two point and the three point function, and to show that these answers can be visualized using diagrams, which I'm going to come back to heavily. So, um, so much earlier in the talk, I cut open the disk two point function and then constructed this Hilbert space over here. So now I've given you a more explicit function for the two-point diagram. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut open the two-point function again. I'm gonna cut open, yeah, I'm gonna cut open the two-point function again. So here's this diagram over here, and I told you how to compute it. We're integrating over S1 and S2. And so I'm gonna uh, redraw this diagram here, but I'm gonna put a dashed line through the center. And I want to imagine the region below the dashed line as corresponding to, again, a preparation of a ket and the region above the dashed line is corresponding to the preparation of a bra. And I want to imagine that this diagram is an inner product between the bra and the cat. So as mentioned before, to compute this, we're integrating over S1 and S2. And so I basically want to interpret this diagram as an integral or as an inner product between two wave functions. Um, and because I'm, I'm integrating over S1 and S2, it's natural that the Hilbert space um, should be thought of as L2 of R plus times L2 of R plus, uh, because I, R plus because S is being integrated from zero to infinity. Um, and so I can do this for, so again, um, I can do this so again, I'm, I'm, I'm inserting a matter operator that's labeled by I over here, and I can do this for any choice of I. And so, um, and again, I labels a primary operator. To be more precise, I wanna let I label a primary operator that's not the identity operator. So in other words, a primary operator of like the matter sector. Um, and so the idea is that I can, uh, I basically get a different, my Hilbert space should contain a different sector for every choice of that primary matter operator. And then within this sector, you can cut open the two-point function in this way by integrating over two parameters, S1 and S2, which are physically interpreted as the eigenvalues of the left and the right Hamiltonian. So this means that the Hilbert space um, should, can alternatively be written like this. So here I'm doing a direct sum over this index set, which I call SP, which just refers to all of the primary operators other than the identity. And so in each sector, um, the Hilbert space is given by a tensor product of L2 of R plus times L2 of R plus, where here we're looking at square integral functions of the two S parameters, or equivalently square integral functions of the left and right ADM energies. Furthermore, there's also a sector uh, that's created by, you know, the Euclidean path integral where I don't insert any matter operators at all. In this case, the left and right energies are constrained to be equal to each other just by the gravitational Gauss's law. And so there should be another sector where um, the Hilbert space um, is just a function of, you know, square integral functions of the energy, which is positive. So basically the purpose of this slide is to show that this Hilbert space, which is L2 of R times H0, may be equivalently written like this. So there's a sector that corresponds to states with no matter excitations. And in this case, these states are described by wave functions, which are just uh, square, integral, you know, square integrable functions of the energy. And then you also get sectors where matter operators are inserted. And in this case, the wave function is a function of the left and the right energy, which don't have to be the same anymore. And so sometimes it's convenient to uh, let this ket s be a basis state um, in in the in in this vacuum sector where there are no uh, matter excitations, and then here I can label a matter sector, and then you have S L and S R, which label um, eigenstates of the left and right ADM Hamiltonian. 
Um, good. So now all that we need to do is we need to, so I, so earlier I introduced the operator OR and OL, but I could also give it an I index if I want to refer to different matter primary operators. And so what we want to do is we want to compute um, their matrix elements in the energy basis, which is the basis I just introduced earlier. And so we're going to do this using the three point function. So here's the three point function I introduced earlier. Now I'm going to take the same diagram and I'm going to rewrite it in a slightly different way. So here's I, J, and K again. And so the part that uh, sits below this dashed line over here is the ket. The part that sits above the dashed line over here is the bra. And then between these two dashed lines, I want to interpret this as an insertion of um, the operator O. So it's the operator OJ, but acting on the right. Um, and so basically from this expression, um, I should be able to write it like this. So again, here I'm considering um, inner products in the energy basis. So in the ket, um, you know, I prepare a state that has a wave function, which was determined on the previous slide. And then for the bra, I have another wave function, um, which was determined from the previous slide. And then to find this expression here, um, I basically have to um, demand that this expression is equal to the three-point function I introduced on the previous slide. And then from that, we can read off with the matrix elements of O, J, comma, R, R in the energy basis. So basically the claim is that these diagrams that um, compute correlators can be directly interpreted uh, to read off the matrix elements of these operators I introduced earlier in the energy basis. And so this is a very convenient basis for studying these. And once you know matrix elements of these operators in the energy basis, we can compute an arbitrary correlator because um, you know, if you know the matrix elements of your operators, then you could just insert even more operators on the right, for example, and then you can get an arbitrary correlation function. And the result for these correlation functions is going to be exactly what I mentioned earlier. Um, so the one question, David, in this uh, this particular mm -hmm. matrix that you introduced, um, should it be thought of as a generalization of the three-point function CIJK uh, for JT? Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. The, the, the VIJK is a generalization of CIJK for JT. And this is this particular matrix element you were talking about. Then. Yeah, so this, this matrix element over here um, directly follows from VIJK. It contains VIJK in it, maybe up to some other factors that aren't terribly important. Um, but yeah, you should just think of this as basically being VIJK. Um, so yeah, so I want to imagine, so here I have a three-point function. And I just want to imagine that we're computing this by inserting one operator on the bottom, K, inserting the operator I on the top. And so K makes a cat, I makes a bra. And then in between is going to be some expressions, some matrix element in the energy basis, which has to take a particular form so that the three-point function comes out correctly. And now we know what the matrix elements of the matter operators are in the energy basis. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Right, so now once we know the matrix elements of the matter operators, we can just multiply an arbitrary number of matter operators together with the insertions of the Hamiltonian too to get something nice. And we can compute an arbitrary function in this way. So I talked a little bit about the four point function earlier. So here I have it again. Um, so basically the upshot is that if I want to compute, say, the four-point function, I should think about the conformal block decomposition. So in particular, on the left, I have the four-point function here. And now I'm going to um, imagine that I'm inserting a complete set of states along the dashed line. And so this means I'm going to fuse together these two operators and then fuse together these two operators and then compute their two-point function. So for example, over here, well, this is a conformal block where clearly the state that's being exchanged or summed over in this you know, complete set of states I'm inserting here um, are the states in the matter sector of the theory that's labeled by the matter operator K. 
Um, furthermore, there's also the special case where the identity operator gets exchanged. In that case, I just simply don't draw this line at all. I don't draw this K line. So now I1 is directly connected to I2, I3 is directly connected to I4. So these diagrams here um, describe the, uh, the you know, conformal block decomposition. Um, but in particular, we can use diagrammatic rules to get specific expressions. So all I have to do is, you know, put parameters S1, S2, S3, S4, and here S1, S2, S3, and then just apply the rules I've mentioned before. So these diagrams, they describe the conformal block decomposition, but they also correspond to specific mathematical expressions where I, again, I just integrate over S parameters and then insert extra functions according to how these lines intersect with each other. And these diagrammatic rules obey a crossing relation because of course, Wait, I could have also- One more uh -huh. question that they have here. So uh, if you have, uh, for example, this, uh, uh, so actually two questions. One thing is that we know that if you put some CFTs like the minimal models, which are non-unitary, but they can be unitary versions also. Uh, mm -hmm. Then have this null decoupling and all of that. So, uh, so I mean, all of that is not spoiled if you, I mean, if you take uh, so that the gravitational dressing doesn't introduce new kind of uh, uh, matrix elements which are non. Uh, if if you like, if you still have um, a thing after. So you're so you're kind of asking what happens if I take my matter theory to be a non-unitary theory. That's also was I was going to ask you. Yeah, that was my second uh -huh. question. But suppose if I take a unitary CFT, for example, also and mm -hmm. unitary, null, okay, yeah, where you have this null decoupling because of like minimal models and things like that. Uh huh. The question is whether th those things survive those properties of null deco or decoupling or like you basically you can have a finite number of primaries in the theory whether it survives this. Uh, uh -huh. Good, good, good. So, so, so for, first of all, um, right. So. Uh, there is never a finite number of primaries um, in the theories I'm considering. There's always an infinite number of primaries. For, for, so in 2D CFT, you can have a finite number of primaries, but those are Vera Soro primaries. Here, we're kind of in one dimension lower. Well, the bulk is still two dimensions, but the point is uh, when I say primary operator, I'm referring to SL2R primary operator. And so there are always infinitely many of those. Um, right. Yeah, but um, suppose you, uh, I mean, uh, suppose you, con what goes, what will happen in your procedure if you consider some, something like a minimal model in your setup? Uh, yeah, a, a minimal model would be valid here. Um, yeah, you could take the matter theory to be a minimal model um, and everything applies. So in particular, so just with the caveat that when I say primary operator, I'm referring not to a Vera Soro primary, but to an SL2, like a global primary. Um, but then everything just goes through. And yeah, this null decoupling and so on, you know, it's it's useful in thinking about how to compute correlators in the theory. Um, so here I'm just using the fact that those correlators exist and are well defined. Um, and so yeah, I, I, I guess I guess you're asking about like analytically continuing like dimensions of operators. No, 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 that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking very simple actually. If you look at this original matrix elements or say norms mm -hmm. or uh, so, mm -hmm. and the, my question is simply that uh, uh, suppose if you have an operator insertion, we know that some of the states kind of negative norm in the original CFT, uh, say in the if it's non-unitary or something. Mm -hmm. How does this norm change if you with this S1 S2 whether you have a, I mean, uh, uh -huh. oh, good. So, so, yeah, so basically the norm is, um, so I mean, I'm assuming that, you know, we, we have uh, a basis of states that is, um, you know, well, uh, 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 okay, so I'm assuming that in the matter theory, the inner product is positive. And so any null states have been quotiented out. And I'm also, assuming a unitary matter theory. So there are no negative norm states. And yeah, and, and all null states in the matter theory are quotient to doubt. So they're not actually part of the, the Hilbert space. I see. So your statement essentially is that if I couple a mat unitary uh, matter theory, there is no problem. Uh, yeah. uh, unitary, uh, it survives, it remains unitary in the full quantum gravity. You can- Exactly. 
but this is uh, like we have often he heard of this kind of swamp land scenario or something often right something that uh, that is without gravity once you couple to gravity need not survive uh, some uh, some properties right so, right but here it doesn't yeah. have any unitary no, here here it doesn't have any unitary matter theory will give you a unitary positive definite inner product no problem i see so this is what yeah okay i see okay thank you great thank you um great and yeah so there's a crossing relation here um because of course i could also consider the opposite channel and so um Anyway, so these two, of course, ways of decomposing the four-point function have to agree. Okay, good. So all that was everything I had to say about J2 gravity with matter. Now I can move on to von Neumann algebras. Um, so what is a von Neumann algebra? A von Neumann algebra is an algebra of bounded operators. We'll call it A. It's closed under Hermitian conjugation, and it equals its double commutant. And what do I mean by double commutant? Well, the commutant which we call A prime, is the algebra of all bounded operators that commutes with A. And then the double commutant is the commutant of the commutant. So physically, we can think of a von Neumann algebra as describing a subsystem of a quantum system. So the algebra contains all the operators that can be measured by an observer with access to the subsystem. And the simplest example we can consider is the algebra of all bounded operators that acts on, you know, a say a factor HA when the total Hilbert space is HA times HB. Um, so this simple example of a subsystem of a quantum system, um, I guess produces an algebra, which we call a type one algebra. So if you have Hilbert space factorizations, you can define type one algebras um, and they're very simple. So in quantum field theory, um, the algebra of operators associated to a subregion is type three. Um, and that basically reflects the fact that the Hilbert space um, does not tensor factorize across subregions. And also that entanglement entropy is not UV finite. Okay, so now uh, let's define a von Neumann algebra. So I'm gonna define AR to be the double commutant of the algebra of all finite linear combinations of finite products of bounded functions of the right Hamiltonian and all of the right matter operators I introduced. Um, so in other words, just take the right Hamiltonian, take the right matter operator, multiply them together a finite number of times, take finite sums of those, you have some algebra, and then take the double commutant of this. And now you include even more operators. And this gives you a von Neumann algebra. And so AL is defined similarly. And we should think of these algebras as describing operations um, that can be performed or measurements that can be made in the putative dual boundary theory. So the main result um, of my work is to show that the commutant of AR is AL and that the intersection of these two algebras just contains integer multiples of the identity. And also, um, one can show that AR and AL admit a well-defined notion of a trace. So because they admit a well-defined notion of a trace, they're not type three. Um, and because they have these um, properties here, together with the fact that the Hilbert space does not actually factorize, they can't be type one. And so all that's left for them is to be type two. To be more precise, they're type two infinity factors, which just reflects the fact that the trace doesn't always have to yield a finite number. So here, type two infinity factors. Uh, sorry, maybe a very uh, elementary or stupid question. Or uh, mm -hmm. so, why is it not type one? Why is it not type one? Good. So, I prove. So basically, um, these are statements that I prove, and also that there's a notion of a trace. So the reason why it's not type one is because. Um, If it was type one, and given that these properties hold, then the Hilbert space would have to factorize into a left tensor product times a right tensor product. Um, but the Hilbert space does not factorize into a left tensor product times a right tensor product. So it can't be type one. 
Okay, that's interesting. Um, and uh, it's okay, another question. Suppose I didn't couple to JT gravity. Uh, before I couple to JT gravity, I can also define the same kind of uh, norm. Uh, I, I can probably yeah. still find A, R, and L. And, yep. would, and that would be type three. Uh, uh, that's right. So that would be like quantum field theory, type three. Mm -hmm. okay. So coupling to JT gravity made it type two. I see. Type two infinity, yeah. Basically, the idea, the basic thing, you can define a trace now in this subalgebras and... Uh... Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks. So um, so this equation here is something that's obeyed by any von Neumann algebra. It's just a relation involving the algebra and commutants. Um, and so if we plug in, uh, you know, if we specifically apply this to AL and AR, so here... So let's let A be A R. So then A, so then A prime is going to be um, A L, which is non-trivial to prove. So then I take the union of these two things and take the double commutant, and then this is equal to. So I take the intersection now of A R and A L, which is just multiples of the identity, and the commutant of multiples of the identity is all bounded functions on the Hilbert space. So what this means is that if I am an observer or you know, experimentalist who has access to both AR and AL, um, then I can consider the total von Neumann algebra generated by everything in AR and AL, and that's everything I can measure. And that's just equal to all functions on the Hilbert space. So it's interesting because in the usual case where we have a tensor product Hilbert space corresponding to two holographic CFTs, it's obvious that if I can perform arbitrary measurements on both CFTs, then I can perform, you know, I can measure arbitrary operators on the entire tensor product Hilbert space. So even in the case where the Hilbert space is not a tensor product, this is still true um, because the algebra generated by both the right and the left boundaries is actually all bounded operators on the Hilbert space, including very interesting operators like the length of the operator L, which a priori you know, didn't seem to belong to either the left or the right, but it does belong to the total algebra together. Um, okay, so. Uh, sorry, will you also uh -huh. prove that the trace is unique or is it obvious from the type two infinity property? Yes, so it's obvious. It's supposed to be, uh, it's supposed to follow as a mathematical result. So once you know that the algebras are type two infinity factors, because they're factors, the trace is unique. Um, but when I say that the trace is unique. Up to a normalization, right? It's up to a normalization. And furthermore, there are specific technical requirements that have to be obeyed by that trace in order to say that it's unique. You could also define a weaker notion of trace that's not unique, um, but could perhaps have physical relevance in some sense, or at least is still worth mentioning in my opinion, which I, I plan to get to. Um, So yeah, so in the next part, um, I was planning on proving that the commutant of AR is AL, but I'm thinking maybe in the interest of time, because there were still a few other things I wanted to talk about, um, maybe I'll skip that. And then if there's still time at the end, I could come back and prove it. But basically um, I had this diagrammatic proof. Basically the point is to, uh, you know, assume that you have an operator R that commutes with the left algebra, and then you want to show that it's in the right algebra. And so I had this um, diagrammatic proof um, to, to, to show this, to basically just by drawing a bunch of diagrams. Um, basically, the, the point is that if you have an operator that commutes with the left algebra, if you study this operator in the energy basis, this puts very, 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 very strong constraints on this operator such that it has to take a form. Uh, um, it has to take a form that looks like this, where the operator is a sum over operators in the right algebra, and thus the operator belongs to the right von Neumann algebra. So, um, so I think in the interest of time, I'll skip this proof, but if there's time at the end, you can ask me to explain it and then we can come back. Um, but there are a few other things I wanted to say, maybe in the next 10 minutes. But basically, 
in this part of the talk, the point was just to prove the statement uh, um, that, that the commutants of the left algebra is the right algebra and vice versa. Um, but maybe just so that I don't go over time too much, I'll just ask you to accept this, or you can ask me after the talk and I'll explain it to you. And then there's also a proof that the intersection of these two algebras is, is, uh, is, is multiple to the identity operator. And this proof is also similar, but I'm going to omit it um, just due to time. But uh, really just the takeaway is that the main result is that AL is the commutant of AR and that these algebras are factors. Sorry, and this 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 question about the, the main idea of the proof is this diagrams, but this constraints come from where exactly? Uh, this the fact that yeah, yes. Yeah. So basically, um, I just all I assume is that I have an operator called R, and it's in the commutant of the left algebra, and then you have to show that it's in the right algebra, and so just the equation here that R commutes with a matter operator or all matter operators in the left algebra puts constraints on the matrix elements of what the matrix elements of R can actually be in the energy basis. And these constraints are very, very strong. So strong that um, the only way they can be satisfied is if R is you know, some sum over operators in the right algebra, hence R is in the right algebra. Okay. But uh, uh, so uh, my rather naive question or my, my rather, so what is going wrong? Uh, I mean, if, if there was no JT gravity, uh, what, mm -hmm. where, where it would fail uh, probably at the uh, boundary? Or... Actually, if there's no JT gravity, the algebras in QFT are also believed to be factors, type three factors though. Yes. So this means that um, this statement does not fail if you take JT gravity away. So if you take JT gravity away, you would have, you know, like a left and right Rindler wedge, and these would each correspond to type three factors. So there's no operators in the center. Basically, the reason why there's no operators in the center is because in two dimensions, the center is just a point. And if you just take a field and you just, like if you take a field operator inserted at just a particular point with absolutely no smearing, that actually doesn't define an operator. To get operators, you have to smear local operators. So to get actual like operators in the algebra, you have to smear local operators. A local operator inserted directly at a point is not an operator. So you can't say that's in the center. Right, right. So the main main thing is that you first show this fact that you have a type two fact, these are type two factors and then go about it. Right. Without that you can, I see. Right, so the, yeah. So even if there's no, no gravity, you still have that the left algebra is the commutant of the right algebra. Um, and uh, just, yeah, just as the right Rindler wedge is the causal complement of the left Rindler wedge. And you have that the two algebras are factors. Um, so, so this is true without gravity. It's also true with gravity. The difference is type three versus type two. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so maybe in the interest of time, I'll omit the proof, but um, it's definitely in the paper and you could also ask me after the talk. So now let's just talk about traces. So here, okay, so I introduced the von Neumann algebra. Now, now much earlier in the talk, um, I introduced this notation over here. Um, you know, this, this, I use this trace notation to define a Euclidean path integral. Um, now I wanna ask how literally can I take this trace notation as an actual trace on the algebra? So, I'm going to define the trace on the algebra like this. So here, this ket beta just refers to the hartle hawking state or the state that's prepared, you know, with the gravitational path integral with no matter insertions. And I have a beta over here. And so I can take the bra and the ket for this thing. And then I could insert some operators on the right. And then I could take beta goes to zero. And the point is that um, this will exactly reconstruct the Euclidean path integral if the operator I insert on the right, you know, takes, for example, a form like this. So this expression was designed to reproduce the Euclidean path integral for operators that look like, for operators that look like this. Um, but the point is, this expression makes sense for operators that look like this, but also more complicated operators that were generated 
by taking the commutant. And so this is our, so here, this is going to be our candidate for the trace on the von Neumann algebra. And actually, it was proved in the paper by Pennington and Witten. Um, you know, they explained very nicely that this expression actually does obey all of the properties of a trace. Um, and then because the algebra is a factor, then the trace has to be unique. So um, just to summarize, so once you show that the existence of a trace, you know that the operator, that the algebra AR is not type three, but also because the Hilbert space does not factorize, this means that AR is not type one, so AR has to be type two. In particular, it's type two infinity and the trace is unique. So once we have a unique trace, then the entropy is uniquely fixed and it's completely well-defined because with von Neumann algebras, you know, the virtue of using von Neumann algebras is that you can take arbitrary functions of bounded, you know, ba arbitrary bounded functions of bounded operators. And this means that the replica trick is put on completely firm conceptual footing. So in other words, the usual replica trick where people talk about analytically continuing the number of replicas and they have to try to, you know, argue why this analytic continuation is unique and usually like people wave their hands and talks and things like that. The point is that all this is completely obsolete now. The entropy is completely well-defined because we have a von Neumann algebra and we have a trace. And this tells you exactly how to compute any bounded function of any, you know, bounded operators that you want. And so there's no mystery to computing trace row log row. Um, but uh, still in type two, you, you, you'd you have, a, you don't have like arbitrary kind of density matrices, right? Or you don't have, for example, pure states of this. And so there is some, uh, uh, so uh, so it's, no, but I mean, uh, well, if you, maybe for thermal states and everything, certain kind of, uh, for the, this density, this uh, entropy is defined, but there is, mm -hmm. is there a general definition of like, because you don't have, notion of pure states uh, so is well well what well what you do is um so you could start off with a pure state on the two-sided system and then i can insert some operators here and then to get the reduced density matrix i imagine taking you know usually we want to imagine taking a second half and then we want to imagine sort of like doing a trace over half like over the left half so that you have just like you know Something, something like this. Well, this this wasn't a great drawing, but the, the point is that, um, okay, let me do a little better job. Let's create a state where I insert an operator O here and I put beta one on the left and beta two on the right. So in this case, you know, the reduced density matrix would be something like um, e to the minus beta two H O e to the, uh, minus two beta one h o e to the minus beta two h. So up to normalization, this would be the reduced density matrix. So yeah, so so here's your pure state, and then you get a reduced density matrix, which is this, and then I can raise this to the nth power and take the trace to compute a Renyi entropy. Um, so see what I'm basically doing is I'm kind of replicating the boundary condition here. So I put another, oh, I put another beta one, I put another beta two. And then I'm just kind of reading off along this line, e to the beta, e to the minus beta two h, o, e to the minus beta one, another e to the minus beta one, o, e to the minus beta two. And then if I wanna replicate this n times, I just replicate this boundary n times. And so this is the density matrix. This is also an element in the von Neumann algebra. So I can raise it to an arbitrary power, not necessarily integer, and it makes complete sense. And the trace on it is completely well-defined. And so that's how you analytically continue in the number of replicas. Right, but uh, and, uh, that's nice, but uh, but still this is not a, this is, it, is row squared is equal to row here? I mean. No, row, row squared is not equal to row. Row only has two O's in it, and row squared would have four O's in it. Yeah, so it's not, so in that case, it's not a pure state and. Uh, Right. Oh, sure, sure, sure. So oh, oh, well, oh, oh sorry. You're 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 allowed to consider. I mean, um. Oh, oh, I see what you mean. You're you're saying that there's like no rank one projector in the algebra. Yeah, there's no projector, so 
I, I say. Uh, so, you, uh, so type two, you cannot define pure states because there is no minimal projector. Right, right. right. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Yeah, there's no rank one projector in the algebra. There's no minimal projection in the algebra. That's right. Yeah. So in that sense, you don't have a notion of pure state. Yeah. In so the algebra. Only, uh, yeah. Only, only for certain kinds of states. This is what I'm saying that uh, it it solves. Uh, I mean, you can probably once what I'm saying right. that you take some certain kinds of. Uh, um, but probably these are all that you need to have. I mean, because uh, in some sense, uh, the perturbative gravity states are probably all mixed states and uh, the gravitational dress, the gravitational dressing converts it to a to kind of a mixed state because of uh, your, uh, it comes because of this beta factors, of course. And this. Um, yeah, that's right. I mean, you're always gonna have these beta factors, which would give you some density matrix. That's right. Okay. Yeah, so, um, Okay, good. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah. So, okay, good. So, so, so now, okay, good. So I talked about the trace. I talked about the unique trace. But then there's a natural question you could ask, which is, um, what if I want to talk about, say, a disk with a defect inserted inside? Naively, this is another kind of trace that you might have wanted to define from the Euclidean path integral. Um, and clearly, it's still cyclic because... Um, you know, I didn't have to specify an origin of time on the boundary. Um, oh, sorry, there's something in the chat. Sorry, sorry, ignore it, ignore it, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry, okay. Okay, I'll ignore it. Um, so good, so, so, so here, um, this, is, this is my Euclidean path integral and I've inserted a defect. You can think of it as being like a conical defect or something like that, um, or a hole or something like that. But the point is, naively, this also looks like a cyclic um, trace. And furthermore, it's actually possible to choose the defects so that this trace is positive. And I, in the paper, I did this. But basically, you can take the trace, you can take this defect to be a cusp. And there's a way to define a trace um, like this. But the point is that this trace that's being defined is only being defined on operators that take the following form. And these operators form a dense subalgebra of the von Neumann algebra. And so because the trace on the entire von Neumann algebra is unique, this means that the trace, this alternate trace, trace tilde that I've defined here cannot be extended to a trace on the entire von Neumann algebra because it would differ from the unique one. And this, um, there's some technical conditions on, on the trace. Namely, these conditions are that they have to be faithful, semi-finite, and normal. Basically, this physically just means that the trace has to be continuous in a certain sense. And so this, pro th th this property has to fail for this alternate trace that I've introduced. Um, but you could still imagine that there exists a different von Neumann algebra for which operators of this form make a dense subalgebra and for which this trace is the unique trace on that algebra. So for different algebras, you could have different traces, but the point is that the algebra AR that we considered is physically distinguished because it represents, um, you know, Lorentzian physics in ADS space. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to do was just uh, compare this way of thinking about gravitational entanglement entropy with other ways of thinking about gravitational entanglement entropy from holographic codes um, and fixed area states and semi-classical gravity. Um, so fixed area states and holographic codes have been discussed previously in these papers over here. Basically, we're going to you know, mock up the bulk semi-classical Hilbert space using a holographic code. So in particular, I'm going to assume that the Hilbert space takes this form. So here, the sum over A is like the sum over super selection sectors. And each super selection sector corresponds to a semi-classical space time where the area of the extremal surface takes a definite value A. And then once we fix the geometry, you can imagine um, having quantum fields that propagate. Um, and so H left corresponds to the left entanglement wedge and H right corresponds to the right entanglement wedge. Um, and so this is just a way to think about it, defining a code subspace that describes these semi-classical states. For simplicity, just to explain the point as clear as possible, I'm gonna consider a two-sided black hole. So in particular, um, the right algebra will correspond to the right exterior of the two-sided black hole. The left algebra corresponds to the left exterior of the two-sided black hole. And now we might be interested in computing uh, the partition function of the black hole. 
And so what's this partition function going to be? Well, from the boundary perspective, we just have the usual formula for our partition function for the black hole in the boundary theory. And then the bulk. Um, so I imagine doing, so this trace is to be thought of as a sum over super selection sectors. So we have a Hilbert space that is a sum of diagonal blocks, each block labeled by an area. And within each block, we want to compute um, you know, the partition function of the bulk fields. So the fields whose degrees of freedom describe the Hilbert space factor, um, HR. And in addition, we want to weight this sum by an additional degeneracy factor of E to the A over 4G, because the bulk theory doesn't have the black hole microstates in it. So they kind of have to be inserted by hand to get the correct answer for the partition function. Um, so in other words, um, you know, for every macroscopic black hole, you can compute the partition function of the bulk fields in the exterior of the black hole, but then you also have to include the black hole degeneracy as well to get the actual partition function. Anyway, th this formula isn't meant to be a precise thing that exactly captures semi-classical gravity. In particular, the Hilbert space definitely doesn't factorize as shown here, but it's really just meant to inspire um, a precise mathematical question I will now formulate on the next slide. So this is a kind of a formula that's sort of inspired from these holographic codes. And so what I wanna do is given that I've explained, you know, my setup in JT gravity, I wanna represent this algebra AR, or I wanna ask, is it possible to find a representation of this algebra on a Hilbert space such that this abstract trace that I've introduced earlier on the algebra is equal to an ordinary trace on the Hilbert space that carries the representation uh, where A here is now the representation of A. And uh, maybe I can insert, and I, and I wanna ask if it's possible to do this where I allow myself to insert an operator called E to the A over 4G where A should commute with the operators in AR because the area operator is sort of as thought of as being in the center. So anyway, the point is, can I um, realize this? Um, yeah, so the point is, can I, can I realize this abstract trace as like a concrete, you know, type one trace, like, you know, canonical trace, if you will, on a Hilbert space that represents the algebra. And I'll allow myself to insert something that plays the role of the area operator, which commutes with AR. And so basically the upshot is that um, the separable representations of type two factors can be classified. And one can conclude that having a formula like this is actually not possible. Um, so an example of a representation of this algebra is the Hilbert space that we started with. Um, in that case, if you take a trace of an operator in AR and a trace of an operator in its commutant, which has to be an AL, one can show that that is always infinity. Um, and in particular, any representation of this algebra AR can basically be, be built out of uh, the representation that corresponds to the Hilbert space that we considered before. So basically, if you try to write a formula like this, it's always going to be infinity. So we see a little bit of the tension here um, between this type two way of thinking about these algebras and then the holographic codes, which kind of um, invoked, you know, which basically were built using type one algebras. And so, the, um, so the, basically your statement is that there is no entanglement, which uh, uh, basically that's what you're trying to say, because uh, uh, because I think JLMS can be shown to imply entanglement wedge because uh, from this operator error correction theorem or, or operator. Right. Uh, so if one, if, if JLMS, JLMS is actually the only ingredient there in, in the proof. Uh, so if uh, JLMS, mm -hmm. fails, then the entanglement wedge also fails, right? But, uh, well, I, well, I want to say that the entanglement wedge still makes sense, but the appropriate way to think about the entanglement wedge is not as a tensor factor of the Hilbert space, which is usually what is assumed in these holographic code proofs of entanglement wedge reconstruction. Instead, I want the entanglement wedge to be defined by the algebra AR. And so um, instead of describing like a subsystem using a tensor product factorization, I want to describe a subsystem using an algebra. And that seems to be more appropriate in this setup and probably more generally. Um, so in other words, the holographic codes are good for intuition, but here we're describing type two two algebras, not type one algebras. And so we can't literally lift that formalism and those proofs. 
the proven entanglement wedge reconstruction. Okay. Right. Um, okay, so that was the last point I wanted to make, um, and I can move on to the, um, the discussion or the conclusion slide now. So, um, yeah, so really the main takeaway from this talk is that once you classify or see study the physical algebra associated with an ADS boundary and you understand it to be a type two factor, then the entropy is unique and completely well-defined from the formalism of von Neumann algebras. And so this completely supersedes the replica trick. Um, and the reason why it was actually possible to do this analysis that I described today is because the bulk theory JT gravity with matter is completely solvable. So it was very easy to cut open the Euclidean path integral and obtain a Hilbert space for a theory with a clear Lorentzian interpretation. So the question that one might want to ask is, is there a similar story that one can show in um, theories that are not explicitly solvable or maybe examples with wormholes uh, where you know, there are probably many more interesting phenomena to, to discuss? I mean, in particular, this paper I mentioned before by Wong, he used von Neumann algebras to study the replica trick in the West Coast model. And so um, it would be interesting if a similar analysis could be performed in JT plus matter. In other words, can we describe the replica trick in the theory of JT plus matter you know, with the replica wormholes more explicitly using von Neumann algebras and the formalism of you know, JT plus matter that I described today? Um, okay, so I guess that's the last point I had to make. So I'll just say uh, thanks very much for your time and thanks for inviting me and uh, happy to take any more questions. Thanks a lot for this great talk, David. And uh, thank you. Indeed, uh, we can have questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so just a clarification. So what mm -hmm. we are actually uh, doing in what we can actually do in replica trick is uh, sort of define the notion of entanglement entropy associated with the region. Sorry, I think I only heard half of your question. You're muted, Krishna. Uh, so oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. So I was asking that uh, using replica trick, we can always also define uh, the entanglement entropy associated with a given region of a space time, right? So uh, what uh -huh. does it mean to formulate that question in von Neumann algebra language? Like, uh, what is the notion of state in this case? Like, we don't have localized states, right? Right. So All the we have is localized state, algebras. Right. So we have the algebras. So formally, states can be thought of as, um, you know, you, you, you can think of a state as being defined by the expectation value that the state would assign to every element of the algebra. Or in this case, you could think of states as a density matrices. So, you know, positive uh, matrices with normalized trace that uh, are in that, the algebra. That would be true. Uh, yeah, that would be true if you have a like type two or type one setup, but uh, in a type three setup, would it still work like pure JT or? Uh, well, in a, in, a say... in a type three setup, uh, the, the type three setup is not realizable in JT. To, to get a type three setup, you'd have to discard JT and just consider the QFT only. Um, and in that case, the entanglement entropy is understood to be uh, UV divergent. And so if you want to discuss it um, while remaining strictly in the continuum limit, then you would just say that the entanglement entropy is infinity. Of course, it's interesting to regulate the theory and then talk about entropy, but um, that's kind of a, doing a different calculation. Uh, I mean, why do you see that in JT, we cannot have a notion of uh, type three algebras, like uh, just uh, just the algebra of observables restricted to the right wedge, Yeah, for that's example, the is a... Of the top, no? <laughs> sorry. So, 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 sorry. This was, uh, no, I'm talking about pure JT, not JT with matter. With matter, it's certainly type two. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, in the case of POJT, it's just uh, like if you have small excitations, uh, they are type three, right? So in the, if you don't have matter, then um, it's it's difficult to actually define what you mean by subregion. Um, that, so that so that's more subtle. Um, 
So, so in particular, you don't have matter operators, but you do have the Hamiltonian. And so the right. algebra that you get is just the algebra generated by bounded functions of the Hamiltonian only. Um, and that's uh, not you even- You also that's, have that's, the uh, geodesic length, right? Connecting- That's right? true. You have the geodesic length, but I think the question you were asking, as I interpreted it, is uh, we want to still algebraically define a right wedge only. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the geodesic length operator belong, should belong to both wedges. It shouldn't belong to the right wedge yes. only. Yes, um, yes. yes. So if you want to define a subregion in pure JT gravity, um, you can't do that uh, purely algebraically. In other words, you'd have to introduce some additional ingredients into the formalism to somehow, uh, you know, like for example, some people like to talk about edge modes in JT gravity, like factorizing uh, Hilbert space mm -hmm. using edge modes, kind of like how right. one might factorize the Hilbert space um, in, in uh, gauge theory. Um, so these are seem to be extra ingredients you'd have to introduce in order to have a notion of subregion. Um, and I would say that uh, if you kind of introduce edge modes, you're not getting a type three algebra. I would say that edge modes actually make the algebra type one. Um, so like, for example, um, when people discuss edge modes, they have in mind a factorization of the Hilbert space that looks like this. Right. And so I would say that if you use edge modes, you get type one. So I don't know how to get type three. Um, it, now, with that said, it, it is possible to define type three algebras that act on the Hilbert space of JT gravity with matter, but they have a different interpretation. They're not interpreted as entanglement wedges. They're just interpreted as something else. Because for example, if I go back, you know, way to the beginning of the talk, um, if I go back to the beginning of the talk here, where did I say it? Sorry. Here we go. So I said that the Hilbert space is given by L2 of R times H0. Yeah. And so this H0 here is just the Hilbert space of a matter of quantum field theory. And as a result, this Hilbert space H0 most certainly admits the action of type three one factors because this is the Hilbert space of a quantum field theory. Mm -hmm. But these type three one factors uh, they describe operators in the matter theory, but these operators are not dressed to the ADM boundary. Sorry, they're not dressed to the ADS boundary. Instead, this type three algebra describes operators that are dressed to the geodesic that connects the two, um, you know, the, the, the left and the right uh, ends of the Cauchy slice, oh, the geodesic just, L. Uh, so, so you could, so, so, sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah, please go on, sorry. Yeah, so so define algebras that are measurable on the right. I had in mind defining operators that are dressed, that are inserted on the right boundary and dressed on the right boundary. But you could also imagine defining operators which are dressed uh, with respect to the geodesic length. So you just need some like gauge invariant way to specify um, you know, where you're putting the operator. And one way you could do that is by, of course, you know, gauge fixing, as I mentioned here. Um, so now you have this length, you, ha you have this geodesic that's horizontal and centered, um, and you could use it to define a coordinate system. And then you could define the location of operators relative to this length. And so you could define a coordinate system and then like quantize a Q of T, basically. Um, and so there should be a way to define type three algebras that act on this Hilbert space. So the point is they're not associated to an entanglement wedge. They're not dressed to the right boundary. In order to dress the operators, you have to kind of know about both boundaries. Uh, and just another clarification. So replica trick gave you a unique uh, 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 one uh, unique entanglement entropy, right? But the way we <laughs> define using, sorry. Well, I, I mean, in this talk, we have a unique entanglement entropy. In uh, how are you fixing the normalization? The normalization. Sorry, of the sorry, case? sorry, 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 sorry. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Sorry. Um, my my apologies. 
sorry, the entanglement entropy is unique once you've made a canonical choice of normalization. Sorry. Yes. I, I th this is a detail that I uh, forgot to mention. Sorry, I, I was being too fast. That entropy is not unique. It's unique up to an additive constant, which I kind of conveniently forgot about during the whole talk. Right. Uh, uh, so, so that, okay. that yeah, constant totally cannot right. turn out to be infinite, right? Uh, well, the constant can be, uh, well, for the purposes of assigning an entropy to an algebra, the constant can be whatever you want. Um, is Now, if you wanted to fix it, you would have to, uh, you know, identify a boundary dual theory and then match it to an, a calculation performed in the boundary dual theory where the entropy is unambiguous. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so I think it has been very late. I just, uh, maybe I want to have a very quick question and before ending. So uh, you mentioned that uh, this notion of uh, JLMS of course fails in this, but you still mentioned there is some notion of uh, entanglement wedge. Uh, so in that case, uh, the question would be that do you have some kind of uh, uh, notion of error correction in type two and uh, correctability and whether it's approximate correctability or what's this notion, appropriate notion of correctability that you want to bring in? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that's a very good question. Well, I would I would say here, um, so the operators that are used to generate this algebra have a clear boundary interpretation, right? So in particular, um, This means that, for example, if if I wanted to reconstruct, you know, because basically the operators H and O were defined on the boundary, so then their reconstructions from the boundary theory are pretty obvious, right? O is just reconstructed by the putative dual operator in the boundary theory, um, and so in this sense, you should have the exact uh, reconstruction. Um, in particular. Um, you know, this, this entire Hilbert space should be thought of as a code subspace. And um, you can compute, and you know, the correlators that you can compute can, will exactly equal the correlators that would be computed in the boundary theory, assuming that all the appropriate limits are being taken. And so because all the correlators exactly match each other, we expect that um, the reconstruction should happen, um, should be exact. Here's another way of putting it. The Hilbert space H that I've, uh, described should be understood to be the GNS Hilbert space that's generated from the algebra A, R, or like which could also be thought of as you know the algebra of boundary operators and the and and the trace function that I've defined here. So there's a sense in which um, once you identify like you know uh, so so you could imagine building a code subspace by starting with um, the infinite temperature thermofield double state, and then um, acting on that with operators on the boundary or operators in the bulk, given that we know how to exactly identify bulk and boundary operators. And so in this way, you can build a code subspace of your boundary theory and the error correction is, is exact. So if you wanted to have an approximate notion of error correction, um, you would probably have to back off from like the large end limit, which was taken in your boundary theory. So that now the correlators in the bulk and boundary only agree approximately. And so a notion of this was advanced by uh, Faulkner recently in, in a paper on asymptotically isometric codes. Um, and so I imagine that this could be applied here, um, but I don't have more to say beyond that. So in other words, in this here, in this example here, you can say that the error correcting code is exact um, and that you can have an exact mapping from like bulk states to boundary states um, and it's isometric um, and there are no problems there. But then things become more interesting if uh, n, like the boundary n is not infinity. And in this case, you would say that the error correction is can still be done approximately and the mapping from the bulk to the boundary won't exactly be an isometry. Um, yeah, so that should, okay, yeah. Okay, and of course, non-perturbative effects can be more interesting to understand. And yeah, the non-perturbative effects would make things much more interesting. That's right. Okay, so thanks and uh...
uh, I think we have to, for interest of time, we have to really wrap up now. And uh, okay, so thanks a lot for, for your time and uh, hope to see okay, you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, this was great. <laughs> Stop recording.